So, welcome back to the Song of Songs, where we left off last week was chapter five, wasn't it? We were in actually in the middle of a verse, as it goes. We're in chapter five, and we finished off in verse 14, speaking about his golden hands. Remember, his hands are cylinders, his rods, cylinders of gold set with metal. And then the next verse, which we didn't get into, which we'll pick up tonight, his body, his body, or actually, you know, it's actually is the word used is the same word we've looked at already. When uh, it was about the bowels, remember when she was saying my bowels were moved, and it's that word really the bowels. And the commentators pick up on this, but in Hebrew it is that bowels, that innermost being. Sometimes in the feminine, the womb, but the reproductive system that was spoken to Abraham out of your loins. It's that language of the bowel, you know that area. But that's what it's saying, his body, his belly, his bowels, his... And then Mike King James says, carved, carved ivory. You've got King well, James, have you? You've got King James? Yeah. What's your... And it says, um, his body's carved. Oh, yours is New King James? Oh, yeah. King James is better, and in Hebrew, it's better. Well, obviously, in Hebrew, it, it, it is. <laughs> but it's it's bright, shiny. Yeah. ivory. Now, maybe you said carved because the signs are bringing across this image of it of a fine carved ivory yeah. statue, you know, which is flawless and beautiful, isn't it? You know, an ivory statue, you know, you can see why they're being, you know, carved, but it's not in the language, it's bright, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's to shine, that language. Ivory inlaid with sapphires, so we'll go over all of this. But I just had to encourage myself again in this, you know, well, what we're actually reading here, just saying it with you before, Jackie, what we're actually reading here is an inspired description of our Messiah. You know, it's definitely, it's about Yeshua. It's a picture of Yeshua. And so I think that's, you know, always try to understand this for what it is. It's a powerful, spiritual uh, depiction of Yeshua. It started off with the daughters, the daughters of Jerusalem mm -hmm. asking, what's your beloved more than any other beloved? And she went into this description that we're in our third week now of a few verses, but it's that deep, isn't it? If you want to go there and try and understand these things, like I'm trying to do myself. But, you know, it really is all that. And then, as we'll finish off tonight in this chapter, and then go into the next chapter, we see the effect that this description has had. They've asked, what's, who is he? What's so special about him? She describes him. And then chapter six starts with, well, where is he? Let us seek him with you. It obviously has the desired effect. You know, it's an evangelistic passage to understand these things. And they are complex. You know, I say without the commentators, I don't know how, how, how I've done with this, but I've really persevered with the commentators, thankfully the Hebrew language, etc. And so I'm starting to get more out of it than I was at a first glance, etc. So can't continue to explain these things now, what's getting said. But that's the value of it. You see what I mean? The effect that it has is like, it's glorious, this. Mm -hmm. It's glorious. And it ends up glorious tonight when we finish this chapter. Thank you, Lord, for this description. His body, but as I said, is in his belly, his bright ivory. And then this is John Gill. I think maybe one of my favourite commentators on this particular song. It says his bowels are bright ivory and they express the love, grace, mercy, pity, compassion of Christ to the sons of men, compared to ivory or the elephant's teeth. For the excellency of it, Christ's love being better than life itself oh. and for the purity and sincerity of it, the white, the pure yeah. white, isn't it? And excellent, the sincerity of it, there being no hypocrisy in it, and for the firmness, constancy, and duration of it, it being from everlasting to everlasting, without change or variation, and then to an overlay of enamel or sapphires for the riches, worth, and value of it. So that's a great picture, isn't it, of what's being said here, you know is uh, belly, is that seat of compassion, 
Mm. You know, the compassion, it's pure. Mm. It's without hypocrisy. It's constant. Mm. It's such a great picture, isn't it? Mm. Ivory is um, the word shame, which is usually, and for obvious reasons, and as John Gillick referred to, tooth, you know, like an elephant's tooth, mm. tusk, the ivory, isn't it? Well, in, in the Hebrew language, the, the word for ivory is usually translated as tooth, mm. for obvious reasons. But the root of this word is shame, is the word shanan, shanan. And we have looked at this. I don't know what the context was in one of our studies not, not, not long ago, but it came out and it was this word shanan, which is the root word of ivory. Mm. Ivory comes from this word shanan. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, when it says, you shall teach them diligently, talking about all of the commandments of the Lord that God gave to Moses, you shall teach these diligently to your children. So you get the understanding there, don't you, of what this ivory is? Mm -hmm. This language is about one who teaches diligently. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what our uh, Messiah is, isn't it? One who instructs, one who teaches disciples. That's what he is, isn't it? And so you can see this language from the ivory. It's to do with teaching diligently. And then another couple of ivory scriptures, just to get the context, is First Kings chapter 10. First Kings, I mean, it's not like you see it in... This um, translator is ivory all over the place. It's only a few times. It's usually two, as I said. First Corinthians, uh, first Kings, chapter ten, verse eighteen. Moreover, this is talking about Solomon. The king made a great throne of ivory. So ivory has got to do with this royal sea, hasn't it? This king throne royal. Language is connected with royalty because, moreover, King Solomon made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with another word we'll look at again. We've already come across overlaid it with fine gold or pure finest gold, you know, the finest of gold. It's been completely refined, it's without impurity. Yeah. We looked at it a few weeks ago this word, pazaz. Remember, the head was paz. And we'll see it again later with the feet, paz, fine gold, paz as the finest gold. And that's what King Solomon's made a throne out of. So we can see its royal connection, can't we? Another royal connection is in the famous sister or brother, Sam, whatever is the right way of putting it, to this song is Psalm 45, verse 8. All your garments are scented with mere in aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. So we've got that, have you? Ivory is throne, palace, it's royalty. Mm. Royalty, and that's who our beloved is, isn't he? He's the king of kings. He is the king of kings. Mm. And that's what's being described here, his, bo his body. You know, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Yeshua bodily. Mm. You know, his body depicts this royalty, but this ivory royalty, this fine, pure, mm. flawless, car, you know, carved, as we've said, just mm. to get the, the perfect statue side mm. of things, but uh, it goes deeper than this. And then the next part, let's have a little sapphire study, because that's what it says. His body is, his belly is bright ivory, inlaid or overlaid, with sapphires. Sapphires is a great word. You see how the Hebrew language has really affected all the languages because, you know, we say sapphire, and in Hebrew, it's sapphire, sapphire. And then when you see it in Greek, it's sapphiros. So it just carried on. It's, you know, it's traditional Hebrew word, this sapphire. Now there's a few sapphire scriptures just to see, again, the majesty of what, what is being described here by the Shulamite is telling his daughters in Jerusalem about why her beloved is like no other. Well, there is no one like our beloved, there's no one like Yeshua. There's many gurus, many teachers, 
you know, many cults and all the rest of it, false prophets, but there's no one like God who loves, you know, he is heavenly. He came from heaven, didn't he? You know, he made the earth and he came from heaven. And that's what Sapphire speaks of. It's a heavenly jewel. And why do we say that? Because of Exodus 24, verse 10. Well, verse 9. This is that great Exodus 24 when the covenant's being ratified with blood and so on. And then Moses, verse 9, went up also Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, the 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved way of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. So that's what this beloved is. It's bright ivory overlaid with heavenly jewels, sapphire stones, which speak of the heavens. It's, really, it's where our beloved came from. It's where he is right now. You know, sapphire speaks of that. Um, I'll just mention it now, and then we'll come back to this, I think, in a minute. Exodus 28, 18, we'll probably come back to this in a minute. I mean, it's obviously Exodus 28, 18 is the, the high priest's breastplate. And again, we looked at that last week, didn't we, with the bed up, and equated it with one of the sons, and Sapphire. Yeah. Sapphire was, was, equate with, um, was equate with the fifth stone, so that was equate with Dan. Dan, I'll just get this bit out now because I mentioned it last week that we might get to this. And we didn't get there last week, but here we are now. And I'm only just saying this because of the prophecy that we read last week, the cheeky prophecies. Remember mm. the cheeky prophecies last week of Malachi? And it said that they would strike the judge of Israel. They would strike the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. Remember? Mm. Well, the judge is Dan. Dan yeah. is the judge, and Dan is the fifth stone. He is the fifth son born to Jacob. So Sapphire equals Dan on the breastplate. Dan is judge. Mm. So you can see the whole picture, can't you? Ah, see what I'll be this. Mm. He's the man from heaven, mm. but he's the judge mm. of all the earth. All judgments given to him. Dan to judge. He will judge his enemies. He will judge his enemies. We were all his enemies, but because we believe in him, we've been judged, haven't we? We've been acquitted. We've been justified mm. because of faith in Messiah. See, we is our beloved. So more of this, please, here, sapphire language. Just wanna, it's not as if there's much, are we, in the Bible, but there's a few, and there's another one which you'll be familiar with. It's Isaiah. 54, the glorious Isaiah 54. It is, isn't it? Isaiah 54 is a, a New Testament scripture. You know, Paul explains Isaiah 54, doesn't he? In Galatians 4, it's quoting from Isaiah 54 in Galatians chapter 4. Obviously, it's right after Isaiah 53. It's said because of Isaiah 53, because of Isaiah 53, there's an Isaiah 54, and it's glorious. But I'm only going to go to the relevant verse when it's in verse 11. Oh, you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colourful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. Lay your foundations with sapphires. And then you can see that fulfilled. That's a promise, isn't it, of what God's going to do on the back of Isaiah 53. Because the Messiah has took upon himself all of our sins, because he's made the atonement, Isaiah 54 is a promise. But in Revelation 21, you see it's fulfilling its conclusion. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21 is a great description of the heavenly Jerusalem, but it tells you, in verse 19, just what was promised in Isaiah 54, the foundations of the wall. I mean, in verse 14, it tells you now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Hallelujah. That's why we love Zion, isn't it? <laughs> it's got 12 foundations, and on the name of each one is the apostles of the Lamb. They're the foundations. Well, 
In verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city are adorned, overlaid with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second, Sapphire. So there it is again, the wonderful Sapphire. You can see it in its heavenly context, can't you? You know, you know we are his body. We are the make, we make up his body, don't we? And this is a picture of the heavenly Jerusalem. It's a picture of the believers. It's, you know, we are his dwelling place. This is just a picture of, you know, being precious stones, living stones, all of that gorgeous language of what it's going to be. Amen. So a little bit more sapphire scriptures. Well, maybe just one. It's, there's quite a bit in, well, there's a couple in Ezekiel, which just go along with Exodus 24 in Ezekiel 1, verse 26, and Ezekiel 10, verse 1. Ezekiel's seeing on the throne. He's seeing in the throne room, and he's seeing one like the Son of Man seated on the throne. And it's all sapphires are all there too. So it's that definitely heavenly throne room connection. But the last mention I want to say of scripture from sapphire is another one that we have looked at, but I just want to bring it out again. Lamentations. We looked at it a few weeks ago, but here it is again. Lamentations chapter four, verse seven. And the reason we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, or it really stood out to me, is because it came around the time of the portion in Numbers when we were studying the Nazarites. Didn't look at the Nazarite in great detail, but the Nazarite was on the was in the reading that week, and then this corresponded with it that week because again of this. Uh, well, yeah, it was because of Lamentations four verse seven. Her Nazarites were brighter than snow, and whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than appeared than rubies. That's remember when we mm-hmm. started this description. The first thing she said was, "My beloved is white and ruddy," mm-hmm. and that was one of the scriptures, one of the few scriptures with ruddy. And we looked at it then, but then it carries on. They were more ruddy in body than rubies, like sapphire in their appearance. That's a picture of the Nazarites, people that were dedicated, you know, like, a, like almost the priestly class, but they weren't Levites, mm-hmm. but they were very similar, but set apart mm-hmm. for a, a very difficult vow. Mm-hmm. And that's why I just looked always as that's somehow a picture of Yeshua. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it, that the Nazarites uh, look like sapphires, according to Lamentations, well, the beloved does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. Mm-hmm. But moving on, I mentioned the breastplate. So just one more on that is actually the word sapphire comes from, and it is a famous one, you'll be all over it, Vicky. It's Genesis 15. It's the word sapphire. You've mentioned it recently, the word sapphire, which is Genesis 15 language. And it's, let's go there. You know, it's just covenantal promise language. What we need to be immersed in, what we were saying last study, wasn't it? About Caleb's of the world, people that really studied and meditated on the Abraham discourse with God. God's relationship and promises to Abraham a foundation for our faith. You know, according to Galatians 3, if you're in the Messiah, you're the seed of Abraham. Whatever God and Abraham have set out, it's for us. And the more we'll meditate and understand the promises of God to Abraham, hallelujah, you know, the better we'll be. But this is sapphire language. It's sapphire language because sapphire comes from the word sapphire, which means to tell to declare, to count, to number. And it's all going back to the wonderful Abrahamic promise that God, the God, the promise God made to Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. When God, when Abraham wants to know about his heir and the inheritance he was going to go to, then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and Safar, count. The stars, if you are able to suffer, number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in Yehovah and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This is the gospel message, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Romans 4, 
uses this dance to explain the gospel. So this is the gospel language he believed, and so he was accounted righteous, a bit like you. Well, not a bit, exactly like you, and exactly like me. That's how we're righteous, aren't we? Because of our belief in Yeshua, the Messiah. So we said, verse 7. Oh, no, sorry, leave it there. And I'm just, sorry, one more. Chapter 16, verse 10, just so you can see it in its right context. Chapter 16, verse 10. Then the angel of Yehovah said to her, Sarah, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be sapphire counted for multitude. So sapphire is all to do with counting and it's all to do with the covenant promise that God chose Abraham and Sarah, who were beyond the age. It was an impossibility outside of a miraculous God intervention. That's why they were chosen in this way, to get across the message that this, this, you can only be born again. You can only be saved and justified by an act of God, by a very difficult way, which only God himself can do. Pala, remember all that? Well, that's what's going on here with Sapphire. Take you into that narrative. He's overlaid with this telling, declaring message, righteous through faith, just like Abraham, based on promises, based on promises, not based on merit. You know, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm just looking through my notes, anything I want to bring out from any of the commentaries. But I think I have pretty much summed up what the commentators are saying as well. There's maybe other things, but that's that'll do for now. So the next area then we're going to moving further down this glorious body. We're in Song of Songs, chapter five, and now we have got to verse 15. There's only two verses left, so hopefully we will finish them tonight. Uh, verse 15, his legs now. His legs, his legs are pillars of marble set on bases, which I think we could understand as feet. So that'd be like when sort of legs go on feet. So bases of fine gold. There it is again. We'll come back to it soon. But it's where we started this narrative. My beloved's white and ruddy, chief amongst 10,000. His head is fine gold. So we'll go back to that in a minute because like we said there, head to feet. Fine, finest gold without purity, impurity, mm. without spot and blemish. The Lamb of God. Mm. His legs, and you saying that his, his legs, you know, it's, it's, it's a word that is again not often translated as legs. It's usually translated, going back to its first mention, is Exodus 29, verse 22, when we were getting the instructions for the, the ram of consecration and the wave offering of its right shoulder, you know, its right shoulder. That is the usual translation for this word for legs, shok, which again, you can see kind of this is our beloved. He is the Lamb of Consecration. <laughs> he is the Lamb of God. He is all of that. Any sacrificial animal, animal was pointing to him, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. In the Levitical system. And Yeshua is that. You know, but it is, that's just what it is. It's got that sacrificial side of this, mm. when it says his legs, his shoking, uh, uh, our pillars, pillars. So where are we going when pillars? You know, there's a pillar. You know, I'll make you pillars. That's what Yeshua says in Revelation, isn't it? I'll make you pillars in the house of my God. And that is the language. It's, it's tabernacle language, isn't it? Pillars. Amud, standing ones, standing pillars. You know, the first pillar I thought think of is the beautiful pillar of fire mm -hmm. and cloud. You know, the pillar of fire and cloud that led them by night and by day in the wilderness, that pillar. Mm -hmm. His legs are pillars of marble, but when you say in the temple, that, or the tabernacle, that's absolutely right, isn't it? The tabernacle mm -hmm. with its pillars, and the temple with its pillars, you know, it is this is the picture of the beloved. He is, you know, the, the, the fullness of the temple. It points to him. It's, it's a picture of him. So it's right that these pillars are in the tabernacle. It's tabernacle language. And then even more, 
as we go on to the basis of fine gold. That's tabernacle language. But before we do, let's just have a quick look at the marble, because the marble is another thing I just want to bring out like I did before with the with the with the ivory and just seeing it in its temple context and its uh, sorry in its palace context, mm -hmm. its royal context. Well, marble isn't everywhere, but it it's mentioned in First Chronicles 29. Ah, oh, this is gorgeous. You know, worth reading this chapter yourself. It's David's final words. It's when he's done everything and he's about to hand over to Solomon and it's a sort of prayer of dedication and thanksgiving and everything. It's a great chapter either. But only, I'm just bringing it out now to, to set the scene for what the marvel is. And then it says, chapter 29, First Chronicles. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for Yehovah Elohim. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for the things to be made of gold, silver for the things of silver, bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, onyx stones to be set, glistening stones of various colours, all kinds of precious stones and marble slabs in abundance. So marble, you can see its use was temple. It's a temple um, stone. It was used in, in abundance in the making of the temple, the house of God that David got ready for Solomon to build. Mm. Great, what a great picture there, isn't it? And then another place, so that's a temple feature. And then the only other place that I could find where marble is actually mentioned as marble, apart from First Chronicles 29 and here, is in Esther. Esther, I'm not going to go there, but it's in Esther chapter 1, verse 6, when it's describing the splendour of King Ahasuerus, his court, and it was all full of marble. So I'm only bringing that out because marble is a temple stone, but it's also a royal palace stone. And I really am mentioning the two together because I think you can probably guess where I'm going to go with all of this, where we'll finish off with this description, is the royal priesthood, the Melchizedek message of our Messiah is a king and a priest. We'll come back to that after. But I'm just mentioning where the marble is used. It's a temple stone and it's a palace stone. It's priestly and it's royal marble. But again, it's not often used, but it comes from the word sheesh, which is often used because that word is often used again in the context of the tabernacle and the priestly garments, because it's more often translated, not marble, sheesh, but fine linen, fine linen. You can maybe see why, because of the whiteness of marble and the whiteness of the fine linen, but it is the same word. The word for linen is sheesh, and it's used, translated usually as linen, but in these few occasions, marble, and there might be explanations to that, I don't know if I'll read, I'm not sure. But what I do want to say is, is that uh, it comes from the word sheesh, which comes from shagish, which means to breach or to whiten. So it makes sense, doesn't it, why marble would be this way, I suppose. But it's all to do with this bleaching and whitening, you know, like we've washed their garments mm -hmm. in the blood of the lamb and made them white. You know, that is the... What I'm seeing in the fine white linen, you know, from Revelation 19, what fine white linen represents, don't we? The good, the righteous works of the saints, mm -hmm. you know, white linen. That well, this is him. His legs are pillars of marble, of righteousness, and fine white linen. He's a priest. Set on bases of fine gold. But I've got a few notes highlighted here from John Gill, which I think I will just take just a second to read. He's saying that the legs of Christ thus compared denote the strength and power of Christ. This is why I want to read it. To bear up his legs and support what has been or is laid upon him. 
as the whole universe, the earth and all that's in it, the covenant of grace, its blessings and promises, which she is the basis and foundation of. The whole church, the persons of all the elect whom he represented in eternity and now in time, all their sins and transgressions laid upon him and bore by him in his body on the cross. The government of his people on his shoulder, their burdens and them under all their trials, temptations and afflictions. That's how John Gill explains these legs mm. as pillars of marble, just a strength mm. to support. You know, the way pillars do, the weight of what they support. And that's what John Gill brings out of these marble pillars, these legs that support mm. the universe, <laughs> the covenants. The governments will be on his shoulders. That language is great, isn't it? So now moving to the bases, the bases, and continuing with the tabernacle nature of this language. You know, which is describing the beloved with tabernacle language. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? He is the tabernacle. Destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. This he spoke of his own body. His body is the temple. She's describing his body. And now down to these feet, these bases. And the reason I say it's temple language, but remember it, from the study of the tabernacle in Exodus, we came across this word in Exodus 26, verse 19. The word for bases was Eden, and it came from Adon, Lord, Master, Adon. You know, that is where the word for Bases came from, and you remember them bases, don't you? You really do, and you know what to say. It. Them bases in the tabernacle were for oh. joining, well said, the boards together. And we really brought it out in the Hebrew and everything, didn't we? When we looked at that structure of the tabernacle and these boards, which represent people, that their hands, their tenons were joined together in these sockets or bases. Or a den, which comes from Lord. And that what the message we brought out then is that that is our unity, is that we are coupled together, we are joined in the simple doctrine that Yeshua is our Lord, that He is the Lord, there is no other. And uh, we hold hands in, in unity, don't we, in agreement, and we're joined together in His Lordship, His one Lord. One faith, mm. one baptism. We're all baptised into the one faith, aren't we? Mm. And Yeshua, our Messiah, is Lord. So mm. this basis, sockets, is that mm. language from the tabernacle. I think we can see it. It's feet, can't we, at the bottom of these legs of pillar, these marble legs, described as pillars. We've got these bases. And then once again, I've already alluded to it, but I'll bring it out again now, that they are of fine gold. That is the word, paz, paz, remember? Pazaz, we said it. Pazaz is the root of this word. We've already seen it tonight in First Kings chapter 10, that he had a throne of ivory overlaid with pazaz, the finest gold that there is, with Solomon's throne. So once again, we've got that royalty picture with fine gold. His head was this paz, fine gold, and now his feet are fine gold. And so just to remind it of what we looked at when we looked at the head, and it's always worth a reminder, you know, not a big long one, but if I just probably go to one scripture, Zechariah, if you remember it, Zechariah chapter 6, because what I brought out with the head, and this is our beloved. What's your beloved more than any other beloved? What's so special about him? How is he different from all the other beloveds out there? And this was crucial to understand. Our beloved is different. He is unique. And this was the, the, the understanding from the head is fine gold. Now his feet are fine gold. This word paz. And then when we looked at it with connection with the head, we mentioned, didn't we, that the first gold crown we really come across was in Exodus again, 
when it was Aaron, the high priest, and a, and a crown of gold was made for him to put on his head, a crown of gold um, for the high priest. And then, obviously, you know, a crown of gold is a kingly headdress, isn't it? Kings wear them. But the high priest also wore a crown of gold. So what I just want to remind us of is, Je is Zechariah chapter 6. What a passage this is. We'll be back in this in the Torah on the Shabbat because of this uh, branch that we're going to read about. Branch. But anyway, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. Take the silver and gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head of Yehoshua. You know, Yeshua. Set it on the head of Yeshua, the son of Yehoshadach, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says Yehovah, Sabaoth, saying, Behold the man. We've read this recently, having Pilate's language. Behold the man. Behold the man whose name is the branch. For his place, from his place, he shall branch out. And he shall build the temple of Yehovah. Yes, he shall build the temple of Yehovah. And that's what we've already said. I'm going to destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. I'll build by church. You know, that's that language, is it? We are his temple. He will build the temple of Yehovah. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. Well, where have you ever seen a priest sit on a throne? That's right, no way. You know, in so far, uh, in the words of God, in the instructions of priesthoods, God never said, make Aaron a throne. Mm -hmm. Let Aaron sit on his throne all day. No, Aaron was about, you know, he was up and about, wasn't he, doing things? This is amazing language. He will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both, both officers. Mm -hmm. The council of peace, there will be absolutely complete peace and agreement and harmony that Yeshua is able to sit on his throne as a priest. Mm -hmm. That's what's so different about our Bible with amongst many other things. But he is a king and a priest, which is, it's just, can, it, it can only be pointing to Melchizedek. And that's how important it is. Not just the understanding mentally of this, or yeah, I understand mentally. It's the understanding how we fit in with this. Because if we are to understand our real function at a time such as this, on this earth, it's got to be in the context that you're the kingdom of priests, hasn't it? It's got to be in the context that you are a member of the royal priesthood. You can't function as a Levitical priest. We don't bring animal sacrifices, do we? We are of a much more glorious, higher priesthood than Aaron and the Levites. We are, in fact, living sacrifices. Like you would allude to early, Jackie, this renewing my mind language. You wouldn't be saying that if you were in a living sacrifice. It's the connected in Romans 12. Off your bodies as living sacrifices being used in your minds, it's all connected. You know, our sacrifices are sacrifices of praise, aren't they? Mm -hmm. The fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, as Hebrews 13 says. This is the part of the royal priesthood. We've got to know how to function as a priesthood, mm -hmm. but you won't be able to unless you know that you are a member of the royal priesthood. And that is an understanding that I continue to see, you know, to understand more, to operate in more the royal priesthood, the authority of the believer under Messiah, you know, being able to ask things according to his will, and it's done. You know, the real authority that we haven't got, but we've got in Messiah. And if we know his will, we pray according to his will, and we'll have confidence that these prayers will actually be answered. You know, that we'll actually achieve and do things as we operate as a royal priesthood. There's no alternative to this. There's just spectators or there's activists who want to stand their role 
and it will always have to fit in with that understanding of Melky's Eddie. You know, just because you don't hear it all over the place doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> it's it's sad that you don't hear more about these things. You know, listening to one of the finest speakers the other week, uh, <laughs> what's his name, Reuven, Reuven Doran, done a beautiful, beautiful message on the tabernacle of David. You know how relevant that is to the NDs and Acts 15, the restoration, the raising up of David, the tabernacle of David. And he said some amazing things. He said David was so far ahead of his time. Ah, man, because David had a tabernacle, didn't he? <laughs> you know, he had his own tabernacle going on. We don't know much about what took place, but it makes sense of why King David will say things like, let my prayer be like incense. Let the lifting of my hands be like the even a sacrifice. David wrote Psalm 110 about Melchizedek. You know, it was a game's life changer for me when I read Hebrews 5. There's so much to be said about Melchizedek, but you've become dull of hearing. It's hard for you to understand it. Stop me in my tracks and made me pray and seek God on this. Teach me, Lord. And it's a process that I'm still a student of. You know, but it's that important, this understanding. And David was one who was ahead of his time, he was a prophet, but he operated as a king and a priest in that sort of way. But the one thing I was surprised Reuben Zorim didn't mention was Melchizedek, <laughs> because that's what's going on here. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And Psalm 110 says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's a king and a priest. Yeshua is a king and a priest. We're a kingdom of priests. We're a members of the royal priesthood. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Amen. So I'll just mention righteousness then. So one more scripture on that. In Psalm 89, just sort of fits in with what I'm saying about Melchizedek, and the king of righteousness, and uh, these sorts of bases, the foundations of all of this, these marble pillars set on bases of fine gold. Psalm 89, verse 14, another royal scripture, righteousness and justice. Righteousness, Zadik, Melchizedek, is righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. You know, that's why I'm saying it all. It's a royal priestly description, isn't it? I think you can agree. She's this, who is your beloved? What is your beloved more than any of beloved? What is your beloved? That you so charge us. This is what our beloved He's a king and a priest. He's all about the palace and the temple. You know, he is a king and a priest forever. That's our beloved. Next part is uh, his countenance. Well, yeah, okay. What's this? Countenance, the second part of this verse 15. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellence as the cedars. Um, we've already mentioned this language, it's been mentioned before, I'll say it again briefly, but even his countenance is not the greatest it's, it's translation, it's more his appearance, because now she's summer up there, really. she's gone from his head, she's gone to, through all of the head, hasn't she, and cheeks and eyes and hair and lips and the torso, the body, the belly. Uh, the, the legs, the feet, the hands, all to be mentioned. And now this is like the overall, the appearance, not so much countenance. The appearance, his appearance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. So we'll just mention that briefly because we have mentioned it already, this whole Lebanon. Well, it, even just in the natural, it's gorgeous. You know, the picture of Lebanon is just gorgeous, fragrance. Cedars, obviously, are mentioned in there in that connection because of the cedars of Lebanon. You know, the, the raw materials used for making the tabernacle, the temple, with the cedars of Lebanon. What we read about, don't we, every, every single Sabbath, Mike reads it, Psalm 92, was it that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree? They shall grow high like a cedar. And that is what is excellent about our beloved. Like a cedar, tall, upright, without corruption, because of the strength 
and the roots they grow tall and straight mm. and that's what they're not twisted they're upright mm. and that's what psalm 92 says about the righteous mm. about the the believers of Yeshua, those who are righteous in him will be they will grow tall like a cedar in lebanon mm. so that's what's being displayed here just his total uprightness his excellence, the appearance of him, the gorgeous, lush, green forests of Lebanon, the dead, tremendous fragrances. Mm. That is everything that we've looked at already, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, anything you want to say? No, no. No, okay. So I'll move on now to the last verse of this chapter. Uh, is verse 16. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. His mouth, which again, it's not really, well, it's it's not the word used for mouth, which is pay, isn't it? You know that word, pay, is the word for mouth. And it's not that word, and again, it's not really going back to that area as such. It's the word in Hebrew is, is cheich, cheich, and that is translated always elsewhere as taste. His taste is most sweet. You know, like with people with wine, it's got a good nose, and that's mm. one of the, you know, the fragrance of the wine, it's the nose. Well, that's what's being his mouth, it's not talking about, well, as he looked at his lips and things, this is his cheek, his taste, his taste is most sweet. You see the word translated taste in Psalm 119, verse 103. And it says, Psalm 119, verse 103, as a taster for what this word means. How sweet are your words to my to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. So you get the sense, don't you? Get taste of it. That's what she's saying here. He's tasty. You know, he tastes delicious. You know, like what Psalm 34 says, taste, it's a different word. But you got the same understanding, don't you? Taste and see mm. that the Lord is good. Mm. Don't just have a taste. Taste and mm. see that he's good. Mm. One taste and you'll know. Mm. Just taste. Taste him. He's delicious. That's mm. what's being said. His mouth, his taste is most sweet. Mm. It's the word hey, and it comes from uh, Hanach, which means... Going back to what I've already started with tonight, really, when we're talking about the ivory and the, the root of the word for ivory, Shannon was to teach diligently. Mm -hmm. Teach diligently. That's who our beloved is. He's a teacher. Mm -hmm. He's a diligent teacher. Mm -hmm. He's a brilliant teacher, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He knows how to teach each one of us, doesn't he? Yeah. Diligently. Well, this goes back to that because the root of this, this taste, this taste is most sweet, comes from the root word. Hanach, which is a famous one from Proverbs 22, verse 6, when it says, train up a child in the way it should go, and it will not depart from that way. Train up, train up. So this tasting of him has also got this element of discipleship, being trained by him. He was, his training is altogether sweet. It's also translated... In First Kings chapter eight, verse sixty-three, in regards to the to the temple, uh, the dedication, dedication. So it's got this taste of him mm. is all to do with being discipled and dedicated and trained mm. up, and that's what happened. If you taste him, mm. you'll just want more. Mm. You'll want more of him. The more mm. you know him, the more you love him. The more you understand him. The more you love him, the more you want his training, his teaching, mm. his taste, his sweet. It reminds me of um, just going back to the manner. Go on. Um, I love it, yeah. You know, when it says, that, didn't he taste it and it was like sweet? Oh, yeah. And savory. Oh, yeah. Like you know, bit. so, I mean, because that's what the manner is, isn't it? And he is the word of God. He is mm. all very. It what is. we taste and, and said that. when we done it two weeks ago that the manna was like savoury and it was sweet and like if he that. is the word of God and we taste them then we're tasting the manna from heaven aren't we that's what 
just reminds yeah. me a bit there. I like that very you much. Know, so. I like that very, very much. Very good, that. Amen. The manner mm -hmm. tasted sweet. Amen. His mouth, his mouth, his, his mouth, his heik, mm. it tastes sweet. Mm. His discipline, his training is sweet. Mm. You know, as sweet as it, it's, I'm not going to go into it much, but the first time that this word is used is in Exodus chapter 15, verse 25, when we came across the bitter waters and God showed Moses a tree. And when Moses threw the tree into the bitter waters, they became sweet. So all of that was a real great lesson, wasn't it? When God was saying, just obey me, mm. obey me. And I won't put any of, the, any of the Egyptian diseases on you because I am, in fact, the Lord that heals you. Mm. You know what I mean? So you can see all of this, his mouth, his taste. Mm. It's got sweetness in it. It's mm. got healing. Mm. You can... You can heal the bitter waters. Mm -hmm. His taste, taste and see is good. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? It will heal your bitter waters. Mm -hmm. Your bitter waters will be made sweet mm -hmm. by tasting him. You know, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but not to neglect the fact that this word, hey, Job uses it quite a lot. I see any of the references, but Job uses it quite a lot. And it's always connected with the speech, the speech, you know, so his mouth, his speech is undoubtedly a great connection. Um, his speech. And uh, I won't be quoting anything there because I'm saying pretty much what I've read from them all. So yeah, it's all, you know, his, his taste, his mouth, his teaching, his doctrine mm. is sweet. I it will heal. Taste and see that the Lord is good as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, Psalm 34, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a different way of teaching, oh, but it? no, but it still sums up what we're trying to get across there. And that's what she's saying. You know, she's finishing off now. She's summed them up from head to toe, let's say it like that. She's done a wonderful, detailed, forensic description of him. And now it's summing it up. His mouth is most sweet, his, his taste sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. Altogether lovely, which not everyone thinks like this, do they? About our beloved. On the contrary, Isaiah, isn't it? Let's see, it. Isaiah 52, isn't it? You know, Isaiah 52, verse 14, just as many were astonished that you, his visage was marred more than any man, any man, and his form more than the sons of men. But then it says in Isaiah 53, verse 2, he has no form or comeliness. Mm. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Talk about the outwardly. Mm. But she's seeing far better than that, she? Because she's mm. saying he's all together. And the word she uses is translated elsewhere as desirable. Desirable. He's all together. Desirable. Whereas Isaiah 53 says there's no beauty that we should desire him mm. outwardly. But she sees so much deeper than that, doesn't she? Yeah. She understands he is all together. Everything, call, all of them is desirable. Mm -hmm. Very first use of that word, Hamad, was when God made all of the trees in Genesis mm -hmm. chapter 2 and made them, but they were good to look upon, desirable. You'd want to eat these things. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, the case is. Great, he? Yeah. Makes things that look delicious. Mm. Um, mm, you get all appetised oh yeah, by looking at certain products that the creator's made. That's what she's saying. It's everything about him mm. is to, to be desired. Mm. When you can see what mm. she's saying about him from head to toe. Mm. And then she finishes off. And we'll finish off with this. So then not, not, not a big long one tonight. That's great. Set it up for next week now. So she has said all of what she has said. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. Sounds like the father, doesn't it? This is what the father said, wasn't it? About Yeshua, about the beloved, when he was baptized in the Jordan and when he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice from heaven came to him and said, This is my beloved son. 
in whom I am well pleased, in whom my soul delights. This is my beloved. You know, don't forget, this is the end of chapter five, but don't forget, it reminds me a few weeks ago, but it was only a 16 verses ago, 15 verses ago, in chapter five, verse two, she was asleep and she couldn't be bothered. Remember, the beloved was outside, his hair was wet with the dew of the night, and he was knocking on the door, and she was reluctant, wasn't she? Mm. I don't want to get out of bed. I've washed my feet, I've taken off my robe, and was reluctant. And then when she eventually did, was compelled, because her bowels were stirred, wasn't she? And the liquid mirror and all of them effects. Mm. When she eventually did go to answer, he'd gone at me. Mm. And then she went to see him, and she was stripped. And beaten. And then she came back to the daughters of Jerusalem. I can't find him. If you know where he is. And then they asked, Who is he? And then in a few verses, she has described the beloved in such a powerful way. She's changed, hasn't she? Mm. She is not the same sleepy head that she was a few verses ago. She is wide awake now. She is awake. And next week, You'll get into me more. Obviously, chapter six, the, the daughters of Jerusalem will carry on. She's had such a great effect with a brilliant description of the beloved. They all want to know. Praise the Lord. That's what I call it. I haven't abandoned this to heart. I just want to win souls for the Lord. Don't you? Well, that's you can see there the effect. If we can describe our beloved correctly, then the daughters of Jerusalem, those that are his. Those that elect for salvation, if you want to see it like that, they will want to know where he is. And as I say, I see this in an end time tribulation setting when, well, that's with that taking into what I'll finish off now. Because she says, this is my bride, this is my beloved, and this is my friend, which that's broke my heart many times. I've read that over the years. But it's wonderful. But I always used to say that she understands the situation. He's my friend. I can't say, spouse, that time's past. That invitation was rejected, like the foolish virgins. I don't believe that they are rejected for all eternity. I believe they come to their senses. I believe that's what we're reading about the foolish virgins who have woke up, come to the senses, and we'll see next week how the beloved sees them. Mm. He's brilliant. You know, he is so faithful. Mm. He sees so much beyond our unfaithfulness or faithlessness, however you want to put that. But he sees the end from the beginning, doesn't he? And he will praise her mm. for coming through. You know, and that's how I'll start to finish off now because she doesn't say he's my spouse because I don't believe that that is the nature of that relationship now. She is my friend, which is a wonderful thing still, don't get me wrong. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. And as I've said several times, the daughters of Jerusalem are still here. They ask the questions, they'll start us off again next week. And they are in this time now. Of, of great tribulation when there's one particular friend that I want to think about now where it says this is my friend and I think we mentioned him a few weeks ago when we read chapter 5 and the beloved was saying eat old friends yes drink deeply beloved ones I mentioned then the friends that is there a bridal class and a friend guest at the wedding, what I don't understand all the roles. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to at this stage make a doctrine out of it, but I don't want to shy away either from the fact that there seems to be wise virgins that actually get into the wedding and foolish ones that actually don't, but will make a reappearance at some point as friends. And friends, the most maybe. Famous, if we're looking at it in terms of Yeshua, you know, Abraham was a friend of God. 
James chapter 2, verse 23, says this, that Abraham was a friend of God. But I'm looking at it as a friend of the bridegroom, and without dispute, John the Baptist has to be the most famous, doesn't he? Friend of the bridegroom, because that's what he said of himself in John 4, wasn't it? I rejoice, greatly rejoice, to hear the bridegroom's voice and the friend of the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. So what happens to friends of the bridegroom? Well, you know what happens to John the Baptist, don't you? He got beheaded. He got beheaded. Mm -hmm. And look, what I think also happens to friends of the bridegroom in Revelation chapter 20. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 20. You know, I really hope that every one of us will be wise. I hope that every one of us will be wise and have oil in our lamps. And when that voice is heard at midnight saying, behold, the bridegroom's coming, go out to meet him, that we will go with oil in our lamps and we will enter the weather supper of the land. I really hope that. But if not, if I or you or anyone happens to not and ends up in that time of great tribulation, then this will be really comfortable. And that's what I'm saying in this, that in this Song of Songs, you're seeing the Shulamite that was too lazy to get out of bed, missed the opportunity, missed the call, missed the invite, didn't attend, to being sleepy, to having no oil in a lamp, if you want to look at it in Matthew 25 that way. But, and along with the daughters of Jerusalem, not the daughters of Zion, I've made that distinction have I in the past this daughters of Jerusalem scenario I believe these are the people that will miss the rapture and they are not Philadelphians who will be taken out of the hour of testing they will still have to be tested the foolish and that's what I believe this is and I think this is the end of the story for it. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 and I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who, just like John the Baptist, had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua and for the word of God. I mean, that's what she is witnessing, isn't she? She's a witness to the beloved. And who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now, where's the great reward? And they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. That will bring great comfort to anyone in that last period when the mark of the beast is out there. I believe the great time of testing that the Philadelphians will avoid is that. I believe when the Antichrist is revealed, like Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is revealing, when the man of sin is revealed, then rapture's on. And I believe that the faithful, wise bride that will be taken at that point and will not be tested. But those left behind and those who, who the Shulamites speaks to and reveals the beloved to and those that say as we'll start next week where is he that we may see him that party that will go on to be described as awesome as an army with banners I believe are those that will be face the ultimate test of take the mark of the beast or lose your head and that's clear from Revelation 20 isn't it so that's why I just tied that on with the final words so this is my beloved and this is my friend at that stage, people will be known as friends of the bridegroom, and John the Baptist is the forerunner of the friends of the bridegroom and the faith, you know, he met because he had to lose his head for his faith, you know, and that's what's going to happen, according to Revelation 20, to all of those souls that kept their witness to Yeshua and for the words of God and who didn't wish the beast or his image and didn't take his mark in their head or hand, they will be in the millennium. Mm -hmm. 
but you see me, wow, you know, wow, that is what, you know, that's the reward set before you, that's the joy set before you, that will help you to enjoy the taking off of your head, if that is, you know, where we end up, I hope not, like, I really do hope not, I really want to be wise, it's on you, I hope this is making us wise, I really hope it is, really pray it is now, finish that with a prayer now, Lord, thank you for this description of the beloved life we started off. Thank you as we'll continue next week with the effect that this has on daughters of Jerusalem, on people that love you, Lord. It will have the effect to make them also want to seek you with all their hearts, souls, minds and strength. I want us to do it now. I want me to do it now. And I want us all to do it now, Lord, to be wise now, be getting wise now, getting the oil that we need, being prepared. Help us, Lord, like when we were talking at the start, Jackie's saying the distractions and the real life scenarios that are going on. Lord, thank you that you instruct us through all this. Thank you that you help us to keep looking up, to keep the joy set before us. Lord, not to allow anyone, people or anything to take away from the heavenly vision, Lord, that you want us to behold. So thank you for the beloved tonight, Father. He is altogether lovely. His taste is sweet. Oh, he heals us. He turns us from bitterness into sweetness by his doctrine, by his training, by his discipleship. Thank you for the beloved heavenly Father. He's sure you are our beloved. Help us to love you more, Lord. Help us to be able to understand you for our own sakes, but then for the sakes of all those people that need to hear about who you really are, Lord. Not some religious guy that puts people off, but oh, just the chief amongst 10,000, the king of kings, our royal priest. We just give you praise tonight, Lord. Thank you for the great gospel, for our salvation, for choosing each one of us, for calling us out of darkness into light, for redeeming us by your own blood and writing our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. It was slain from before the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to leave it there. You know, it's I don't know, an hour or so. So I'm leave it there. We'll pick up next week in chapter six. So thanks. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.